Welcome to our service today. I'm going to begin by reading from the book of Revelation in chapter 1. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray together before we continue on in the service. Father, you are uh, the Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end, uh, the creator of the universe. You are above all and before all. And everything uh, find, finds its being in you. You deserve all of the glory and all of the praise. So, Father, today we glorify you and we praise your name. And we pray that your name would be made great in our country and and in, this, in the whole world, Father, that your name would be magnified and glorified and that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that you are Lord God over all creation. And Father, as, as Warren comes to preach um, on worldliness tonight and preaching on a church that, that goes off and follows after worldly teaching and worldly things, Father, would, I pray that you would help each one of us pay attention and, and be careful uh, to watch that that's not us. Father, will you convict us if we are those who are chasing after the world, that are doing things uh, that are dishonoring to you, and, and even saying it's in your name, Father. Uh, would you show us those things? We even think now as so many uh, churches all across the country have stopped coming together for services, we are remi reminded that there were times... Uh, in the Old Testament, Father, where you uh, you said to the Israelites that you didn't want any more of their worship because it was idolatry, because they were uh, doing one thing, but their hearts were in a completely different place. They weren't circumcised in their hearts, Father, and you wanted nothing more to do with their worship, and, and you hated it, Father. And so we think now at this time, would you help us just to look into our own hearts and, uh, and look at what we've done here in the church in, in North America? Have we have we done idolatry as opposed to worshiping you? Have we gone astray, Father? And is this judgment on us for worship that is not to you? Father, if that's true, would you show that to us? And would you lead us into proper worship and do proper honoring and glorifying of your name as we come together and we sing and we uh, hear the word preached, Father? Would you correct our, our way and would you make all, all that we do honoring to you, Father, and, and glorifying to you? Father, would you direct each one of our steps? As Warren preaches, would you uh, not only direct our minds and our hearts to what he is saying, but would you help each one of us be careful to apply the word into uh, our lives, Father, to be careful to work it out in, in what we do, and not just to hear what, what's said and go away and do nothing, Father, but would you convict our hearts to go out and to live the word, and to live what we proclaim, to go out and to not be hypocrites, but to be those who are seeking to carefully follow your word and to carefully obey you, Father. Not only obey you, but would you help us trust you in a time where there, there's so much uncertainty and so, un, so much difficulty. And, and we praise you, you know, that it could be so much more difficult, but we do ask that you, you, know, you would help us trust you, that uh, you have all these things in your hand, that you are sovereign over all things, Father. We ask that you'd help us trust you, even though we know we're, we're not worthy. We're not worthy at all. There's nothing that we've done that, that has earned your protection and your salvation in our lives. We praise you because that we did not need to be worthy because your son was worthy and is worthy. Your son was the perfect spotless lamb who you sent for us. We praise you that he died for us and that he canceled the record of debt of sin that was held against us, Father, that we were responsible for. So, Father, would we trust you and would we put you first in our minds and our hearts 
as we face these events that the whole world's facing, Father, would there be a difference in the way that we face them? Would there be a difference in the way we respond to them and the way we talk to one another and the, the way that we go through these events, Father, because we have hope and because we trust in you that soon we will be with you in eternity. Father, would that shape the way that we live? And Father, we, we think of so many churches in Canada right now that are that are struggling and hurting through this time so many churches that are wrestling at this time father we pray that you would encourage them these these broken churches father would you encourage them and would you uh, strengthen strengthen them would you continue to uh, use places that have been preaching your word would you use them faithfully would you build them up in your word would you continue to use them as a light for your gospel and for those places that have strayed away from, from preaching your word faithfully, Father, we pray that uh, you'd be careful in correcting them and that you would show them mercy and that you'd draw them back to yourself. You'd draw them back to the right course, Father, that they'd be preaching your word faithfully once again, being a witness to the gospel. Father, we pray, especially here for, for our local body, as Warren comes and preaches today, Father, would you keep him on the course? Would you keep him steady? Would you give him strength and energy and fill him with your spirit so that he'd preach the word faithfully today? Father, would you use him to, to share your word with us? Would you use him as an ambassador for yourself, Father? Would you keep him and direct him and give him strength today? All these things we pray in your name. Amen. So we'll read in uh, the book of Revelation again, and we'll read starting in chapter 2 now, at verse 1. It's the book of Revelation starting at verse 1 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those, that, those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to, to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Thank you, Pastor Luke. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your strength is perfected in weakness. Lord, it's not by power nor by might, but by your spirit that your work is done. Lord, we pray tonight you would build up your body, edify your people, and Lord, help us to be a witness through that work to the world around us. Lord, we pray that you who are both pure and the purifier of your church, Lord, would work in each of our hearts individually and also corporately. And we thank you and we lean upon your strength for all things. Bless and strengthen your body. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're looking at the church in Pergamum. And uh, these letters follow a similar pattern, and they all begin with who they're addressed to and who they're from. And uh, the first one, or this one, first one was Ephesus, the second, which we looked at a couple of weeks ago, Smyrna, the persecuted church, and this church at Pergamum, we call the worldly church because it's compromising with the world. But before we get there, first of all, to understand what their world was like just a little bit, we look at their city that the church is found in. And the, this Pergamum was the capital city in Asia Minor, or what we know today as modern-day Turkey. And uh, the Pergamum at that time was famous for its university, a medical university, as well as its library, which had 200,000 volumes in its, in its library. And it was second only to the library at Alexandria in Egypt, founded by Alexander the Great. And uh, there was a bit of a rivalry there between the two, the two libraries. And there were also, of course, many temples, as well as emperor worship was prevalent. And we think of emperor worship, the idea was the emperor was seen as the savior of the people. And also the, in a couple of the different temples, we had the temple of Zeus here, and Zeus was actually Zeus Soter, and we think of soteriology or the doctrine of, of salvation from the Greek. And uh, Zeus Soter, that was his official title, and there was a giant throne to Zeus that was a place of offering. And uh, he was known as Zeus Soter or Zeus the Savior. And also, uh, with the medical school, it was dedicated to the pagan god of healing, and the emblem for the healing was a serpent. And of course, in our medical emblems today, we'll see a little serpent. Remember my mom, she had a, a nursing emblem and it had that little serpent on it. Well, that comes back from these times, it goes back in time. And so, of course, the Christians, like Antipas, would be a faith, who was a faithful witness, would teach that Jesus Christ alone is Savior, not Caesar, not Zeus, not the pagan god of medicine, but it is the living God who is risen, Jesus Christ. And so that kind of sets up a little bit uh, concerning the, the church that's located at Pergamum as well as the city, its culture, just a little bit. It was a Roman, under Roman occupation and Roman rule. And uh, also who the letter was from, of course, is the Lord of the church. We see in verse 12 of chapter 2 of Revelation, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. And here, literally and emphatically, this is written in the original language, the one who has the sword, the double-edged one, the sharp one. And there's something ominous about this. For this church, as we get down past the commendation to the compromise with worldliness, the Lord is a, both, a, both pure and a purifier of his people, and this church was tolerating false teachers in its midst. And, the, and the, that which was out in the world, which was rampant, uh, temple prostitution, all of this kind of thing, was being allowed to creep in through false teaching, which would lead to false practice. And so there's 
a real ominous note to the Lord introducing himself to this church in this letter as the one who has the sword, the double-edged one, the sharp one, the one who is able to discern absolutely between truth and error always. And not only in a future time, which we're going to look at, but in the present time as well, in their present, in our present as well. And we also remember in Revelation 1.16, in the great description of our Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 16 it says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength, the glorified Christ. And that out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, a, a, a sword of discernment, a sword of judgment, a perfect judgment. The very word of God is Jesus Christ. Now, this sharp sword for believers is a good thing. The word of God being sharp is good. It separates believers from sin. It does that in our salvation when we are warned of the coming judgment of the holiness of God and the perfect atonement of Christ and we flee to that perfect atonement found in Jesus Christ alone and we're saved. We fall upon the mercy of God through Christ. As many as received him, as I've shared before and from Revelation chapter, or from John chapter 1, as many as received him to them, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And then in our sanctification, we see also the word of God separating believers from sin. Think of Psalm 119, that great, what we sometimes call in theology the full mention principle where we have this full mentioning of the word of God, its purpose, its power. And in Psalm 119, 11, we read, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The word of God separates his people from sin. And we hide the word of God in our heart. And we certainly see the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 4, when the tempter comes, these 40 days in the wilderness, and, and each temptation, the word of God is used, and ultimately the devil flees. God's word is powerful for the child of God, enduring through temptation and giving us right judgment in our path, how we should go. In fact, Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my, a light to my path. And just think of that in the, the physical world realm you know having to go down a path without light is a recipe for disaster you're probably going to fall in a ditch or a pit and so too spiritually god's word saves us from falling into a a pit upon our path as we take the word of god in and through the readiness to obey and through the ministry of the holy spirit willingness to obey god saves us from many hurts while conversely, the Bible tells us the way of the transgressor is hard, but God's word sanctifies and purifies his people, keeping us from that hard path. And God's word is also an encouragement to us. Think in Psalm 119 again, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I love that passage. And I love that word from God's word. So not only are we sanctified by the word of God, we're encouraged and strengthened. And you think of this in the battles, in the trials, in the crises, in all of the things that come our way, potentially in our families or in our workplaces or even potentially from the state or our culture, persecution, tribulation, and it's as though we're in a dry, and again the metaphor, in a dry and thirsty land, a hot, a hot land, we're falling down on the ground, we're eating the dust, we're dying, and somebody brings us cold refreshing water and we drink that water and it revives us and allows us to live and move forward and so too is the word of god we come to the end of ourselves and our own devices as christians we're broken we have nowhere else to turn and we turn to the the word of god and through the word of god to the living god and we are revived in our soul and we are given strength praise the lord for the sharp two-edged sword the word of god not only separating us from sin and sanctifying us, but also encouraging us on the way. But the sword, the word of God, is also judgment, both now and future. And judgment for this church, Pergamum, that was allowing false teachers to come in. And a little later, you'll see the Lord talking about this sword, and he mentions you and them. 
the true believers, those who knew Christ, those who were born again, and them, those who had come in. There needed to be repentance in this church. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I do that sometimes. Let's get back to <clears throat> the characteristic of this sword. Psalm 9, excuse me, Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16 says this. The Apostle John is writing and he says, Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. <clears throat> the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I read this fearfully. I don't want to trifle with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Psalm 2 says to kiss the king lest he be angry. And kiss the king means to submit to him, come under his authority, and to recognize who he is, creator, redeemer, savior, lord, and to re recognize who we are, unable to justify ourselves in the sight of a holy God and to fall upon him alone for our justification through his perfect atoning work at Calvary where he took upon himself the wrath of God for sinners that he gave himself a ransom for sinners in the place of sinners. Substitutionary atonement of Christ. Kiss the king lest he be, be angry. Are you ready to meet the king? Are you ready to meet this one? You know, Luke was reading in Revelation 1 and it spoke of the tribes of the earth seeing him coming and weeping. How good it is to come to the word of God, to come to Christ and weep now in brokenness over sin and to have the wrath of God taken from you and put upon Christ and his righteousness put on you so that you might stand before him without fear in that day. Like with John when he falls before Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ says, don't be afraid, fear not. And he has him stand up. Can you imagine? This is our God, the one who made all things, the one who rose from the dead. But there's a, there is a solemnness to this. And I, you know, I've read through this before and I haven't really picked up on it as I ought to have in reading. When I read this here and I read it with you, and to the angel of church in Pergamum, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, he has it. And he's prepared to use it. He does use it. He will use it, both now and in time to come in the final judgment. Make peace through his blood with this one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Pergamum is addressed here. And then in verse 13, we have the commendation to Pergamum. The praise for job well done in verse 13. It says, I know where you dwell, speaking of the, the people of the church in Pergamum. It's, again, it's a personal relationship. He knows where each of his people are throughout all time. I know where you dwell. And then this, where Satan's throne is, whether that's Zeus's very monumental, it was a massive throne, Zeus Soter, or the pagan god of healing with his snake imagery, we're not really sure. But it's the place of dominance. Now it's interesting, in the book of Revelation, God's throne is mentioned 40 times and it is glorious. It's truth and righteousness and holy and white and filled with light and glory. Satan's throne is mentioned twice. The second mention is it's a throne of darkness. So here's this place of power, temporal, temporary, very temporary, where Satan's throne is. And then this to that church at Pergamum, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not, 
and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among them, where Satan dwells. Just a few things to notice here. They did not deny my faith. They held fast to my name and then the persecution because of where they're dwelling. I just want to look at those three things quickly. First of all, fidelity to his name. This is very personal. Now, this isn't talking about being a Christian in name only. The idea of Christ's name means who he is, that God became flesh and dwelt among us, that he is our redeemer, that he is our Lord, that we take up our cross and follow him in a world for which there is a cost for being found in his name. In fact, in Philippians 2, 4 through 11, it's a beautiful passage. It says here, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says, let each of you look out, look not only to his own interests, and this would be the responsibilities of each person, but also to the interests of others. And this is fellow Christians. We're not only to look out for our own interests, but the interests of others. And then the supreme example of this to motivate us and to give us joy is the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, that is the exact representation it has the idea of a mold, and each coin that would come out of the mold is exactly the same. Jesus Christ is co-equal in essence with God, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. Fully God, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How good to be found in that name, living for that name, that men would know that name ahead of our own name when they look at me or look at you. It's not just to be in name only. You notice it says my name. This is God creating his creatures in his image. Fallen, saving them. Hold fast, you held fast to my name. What a privilege. What a privilege and what a commendation. What a wonderful commendation to this church. And not only did they hold fast to his name, but they also did not deny my faith. Not just the faith, but my faith. Very personal, very powerful. I'd never noticed this before. You know, we think of Jude 3, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The word of God, you know, think we say the word of God and in this context all the word of God my faith it speaks of God's word being faithful not denying the faith of Christ which is all the word of God that he came in the volume of the book it was written of him that he fulfilled the scriptures. That as God and as the word of God is given, we keep the faith. Do not deny the faith at Pergamum. I think of an example of a great general saying to his troops, and, and he's trying to save his nation. And, uh, you know, the values and culture of that nation would be to fight for truth and for righteousness in this imaginary nation, in this imaginary general. And he's saying to his troops, both men and women, I want you to stand to the last man, to the last woman, for that which is right. To stand 
against the hordes of the enemy, to stand no matter what comes, even unto death like Antipas. Stand. Don't deny the faith. Don't deny my faith. And how much more not to deny the faith of Jesus Christ, the very word of God, and to know that one day the trumpet will blast and he will end all wickedness in this world forever. Don't deny, but keep the faith. And my faith, you know, I think, you think of the word of God, and so many people think, well, it's, what is it? The book written a long time ago? It's a living book, because Jesus speaks of it as my faith. My faith, my name. And then the atmosphere in which the commendation was given. You know, it's a sobering thing to think that the Pergam people of Pergamum, the church, at, I should say, the, the saints at Pergamum, were living in a place where also Satan and his armies had their habitation. And if you think of it, the saints of God have their habitation on this earth. And the, Satan and his armies are here too. And it made me think, myself and local churches throughout time, and this local church, the need to be aware and awake to the fact that we are in a war zone. As we are faithful to his name, he says, my name, my faith. Do not deny his faith, the fidelity that we have with him, that we are in a war zone. And how do we treat one another as fellow soldiers? You know, I remember climbing a tree in the lower mainland along Marine Drive, and it was a professor I had known at Northwest Baptist Seminary that I was doing this for. We were both volunteering at a small local church in the Marpole area. And one day he approached me and said he had a tree to cut, and I said, well, I can do that. I went and had a look at it. And uh, I said, you know, when, when we are finished doing this, our relationship will change. And he just kind of looked at me. <laughs> what do you mean? And I said, it's going to be like going to war. You're going to be holding the ropes. My life's going to be entrusted to you. In fact, I remember I climbed and he lowered the stuff and I got to the top of this, this cedar tree, about 70, 80 feet up, and I remember and looking out on Marine Drive, and I remember feeling the tree underneath me was like jello. And I thought, oh boy, this is one rotten tree. Cut the top off and put it down on, on the ropes. I came down and there's almost no, there's about between a, about a half an inch to an inch of living and good material all around the base of that very large cedar tree. And there was, as we looked at that, my former professor and myself, and we're just so thankful to be alive together and survive that experience. We, our relationship did change. It was like we were blood brothers. And we realize that we are in a war zone against the wicked one. We are children of the light in the midst of great darkness. And that should bring us unity a sense of purpose, both as we seek to be edified in the word of God together, to grow in the word together, to pray together, and also to fulfill the great commission together as God leads all of us in that endeavor to be faithful to his word and his name, to not deny his faith. And it is a battle, and it's always been a battle. I don't just look to the good old days, but I look through all time, and I see it's always been a battle. There's always been crisis. There's always been tribulation. There's always been conflict. But we fall on our faces before Christ. When we seem to be undone, we go back to the word. His word is a lamp unto our feet. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. These are not just words in the dust, but these are words from the living God. And he is able to activate them through the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives, both personally and corporately. The atmosphere in which they kept his name and his faith was one of persecution. There is hope in the midst of this persecution, this place 
where the wicked one was in, as their enemy working through the evil that was in that place, the pagan temples, the emperor worship, the hatred of the things of God, contrariness to the things of God. One hope is, of course, the fact that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And also, again, help the word of God that we may pray without ceasing, that we may love one another. And as it's said in Philippians, that we look not only out for our own interests, but also the interests of others, that we confess our sins to one another, that we forgive one another, and that through the blood of our precious Lord Jesus Christ, we are able to come with clean hands and clean hearts with one another as we do these things by God's grace. Because there is a war zone around us. We need each other if we are truly born again. That was a commendation. Then comes the rebuke. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. This is the hard part. It's sin. It's worldly compromise in the church. I could spend months on this. This is convicting. Uh, it mentions here, I'll just read it quickly, verse 14 through 15. It says, But I have a few things against you speaking to the church of Pergamum, you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. This is false teaching. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So Balaam is an Old Testament character. You find him there in Numbers 22 through 25. I'm not going to go through that, the account of Balaam with you. He was a prophet, not a prophet from Israel, but a prophet from outside. And this, you know, the story is interesting to me. God met with him and, and, and God warned him not to pervert the wor word of God, not to say anything wrong or evil about Israel. And he was not allowed and he could not pervert God's word. But he could pervert God's people for a price and a profit. Real good sign of a false prophet is when money is more important than souls. And how did he do this? He led the people of Israel to intermingle with the pagan peoples around them and led many into idolatry and immorality and many thousands were killed in a plague because of this. And the, the sins of the Nicolaitans led to a similar place and they were a group who had teachings that really taught license. We have grace, we can do anything. We don't have to fight temptation, just give in to it. Give in to sensuality, give in to the world. And they were being tolerated in the church and not being thrown out. And the Nicolaitans it was a similar outcome. Clement of Alexander, a church father, one who's considered to be a church father in the early church, lived between about 150 to 200 AD. He writes of the Nicolaitans, he said, they abandoned themselves to pleasure like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. So that's the sin. Idolatry and immorality. And you think about idolatry. And Pastor Luke almost gave away my sermon there when he was, and it was good, when he was praying. Because we think idolatry, you know, I, w I was listening to a sermon by Charles Stanley. He talked about one of the Ten Commandments. He said, you know, most of us think we have no problem with this commandment. We just check it off the box. And I thought, wow, I hadn't really thought of it that way. It's Exodus 23. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. And what we think in our minds, well, I don't have a little idol. I don't have a stone god or a metal god or a, a god made of wood in my house. And I don't have to worry about idolatry. Well, what is idolatry? It's what you give your heart to in worship. It's what has first place. And Colossians 3.5 says, the Apostle Paul, and I'm, this has a context that is beautiful, I'm just going to read Colossians 3, 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's, it's something that consumes you as first. I can remember years ago having a small business and 
being involved in a number of three different churches actually volunteering for preaching and different things. And sometimes I would have a Sunday where I could just sit and hear the preacher and that was great, but sometimes I'd find my mind wandering to all the organizational structures that I needed to think about. And that, that was almost like a beautiful candy being going back and forth in my mouth. Just my mind was wandering to these other things and it's almost as though, and I would pray, Lord, forgive me, help me to focus on your word, to focus on you, to love you more than the temporal things of this world. Anything that becomes the first love of the heart is an idol. Also, not knowing the Lord as he reveals himself in Scripture or knowing just some parts of the Scripture, saying God is love but not mentioning his holiness, saying he is holy but never mentioning his love, never mentioning his justice. God reveals himself fully in, in, whole, in, a, in a whole way, and we need to teach the whole counsel of God's word. Improper teaching of the person of God leads to idolatry amongst his people as well. And Ephesus is an example of the progression. Ephesus, they had lost their first love for Christ. And when that love is lost, we see the progression in Pergamum. When that first love is lost, something's going to take its place. Let us have hot hearts for Christ in the word of God in prayer and also stirring one another up because I don't know about you, sometimes I get cold. Don't let idolatry creep in. And as believers, if we are in Christ, God will correct it with the sword of his mouth because he loves us and he'll show us that the things of this earth are just passing away and they are not to be first. And then immorality, Exodus 20, 14. And of course, immorality is to do with all sexual activity outside of marriage or outside of a proper celibate lifestyle where there is fidelity towards God first and foremost. Both of those are acceptable lifestyles before God. But corrupting the way, uh, in Exodus 20, 14, it mentions concerning adultery. And I'll just take that out of the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. And, uh, and many of us would just, well, that's a check mark. Some of us maybe not, but never done that. And then we read Matthew 5, 27 through 28, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dealing with a lot of people who said, well, we never did that. And then he digs down and he says, it's not just about what you did, it's about what you thought. Ouch. He says, you have heard it, that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, where is our culture at with all of this? In this sex-saturated culture, in the internet of perversion, can hardly open the newspaper anymore. And this is creeping into this culture a promiscuity and sensuality creeps into the church. And quite frankly, immorality has become almost, I would dare to say, another form of idolatry. Something that takes the place of the living God. I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, in the 60s, the principles of chastity, modesty, fidelity, whether it be in a single relationship or in a marital relationship, monogamous relationship in, in marriage or monogamous to the Lord God in singleness, that in the 60s was warred against. And in my time growing up, 80s, 90s, 2000s, somebody who held those principles of chastity, modesty, fidelity would be pitied. I'd seen some of that, even thought of as a joke. And then I look at the present time and it's almost as though these principles don't even, aren't even thought about anymore. Chastity, modesty, fidelity. So what is the answer for the, the church to be purified by the one who is pure? Is the answer to pick our, ourselves up by our bootstraps through self-effort to make ourselves righteous or to be through self-effort alone to make ourselves, uh, to be sanctified? Matthew 5.48, the Lord concludes that section on that we had read concerning not just the actions but the intent of the heart. And he tells his hearers who had a lot of external works but internally 
they were not clean before God. As, as Pastor Luke said, their hearts were not circumcised. The standard that Jesus gives in Matthew 5.48 is, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The standard for justifying ourselves before Almighty God is absolute perfection. Always. No wrong thought, no jealous thought, no lustful thought, no angry thought, no proud thought, ever let alone the actions that follow from these things. That's not the answer. God is merciful. He made a way for us to be made clean. He is the way for the sinner to repent and to fall on Christ for God's mercy. And for the saint who struggles in this world of temptation and trials, is there any hope for you, for me? Again, we need one another to turn one another up to good works. We need one another. We need to weep over these things and pray that we would be a pure witness before the world no matter what the cost. For we live in a place where Satan's throne is. But where our eyes are on that greater throne, the one that will conquer and cast into the lake of fire the devil. For the saints, just a closer walk with thee. Walk in agreement with God the Holy Spirit through his word. A heart open and tender to the word of God and seeking obedience. We need to be under the word of God. I, 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 I've been preaching a lot and that's fine, but I miss, I miss hearing some preaching. I've been listening to preaching, but the Bible, we've read it already. I've hid thy word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's battling temptation and trial. But what about dealing with sin? I remember a professor who, in New Brunswick Bible Institute, and he used to tell the students, keep short accounts with God. In other words, confess your sins as soon as you're aware of them. Repent of them. Turn away from them. Don't, don't let them store up for, well, I'll deal with that next week. Once, they get, once we get enough of them, then I'll, and I kind of did that when I was, was young. We'll just deal with it once in a while. When things get bad and I have a crisis, then I'll fall on the Lord. And, yeah, don't I still do that sometimes? Don't store up your sins. Keep short accounts with the Lord. Do I store it up for a week, store it up for a month, or to, for a convenient time? That convenient time may never come. Why are we not having good fellowship with the Lord right now? Don't store up sin. In fact, 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Faithful. Think of that. Faithful. Because of the perfect work of Christ, he will always do this for his people, faithful and just. It's just because he is both just and the justifier of the ungodly. And that doesn't only pertain to salvation, but also our sanctification. Keep short accounts with God. And that's the exhortation in verse 16. It is to repent. You notice in verse 16 it says, Therefore repent of this false teaching, this worldliness that you have let creep into the church. What is worldliness? Ultimately, it's becoming exactly like the world, the temple prostitution, the filth of the world, the anti-God sentiment and philosophies coming out of the universities there. It was creeping into the church, and Jesus is saying, stop it, repent, turn from it, turn back to me. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. You notice it says you and them. You, the saints who are tolerating them, I'm going to war against them with the sword of my mouth. The Lord knows the difference between those who are his and those who are not, but we are not to tolerate false teaching that leads to false behavior, ungodly behavior. Help us, Lord, in this. In all of the entertainments, Lord, keep our eyes clean, our ears clean, our minds clean. Help us to... to have, to look on those things that are pure and just and right and holy. And then verse 17, this great promise, he who has an ear, there we go again with the ear. Now it's not talking about the people that have lost their ears physically. It's, talk, it's not talking about physical hearing, of course. It's talking about spiritual hearing, having a tenderness towards obedience to God's word. He or she who has an ear, let him or her hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
And there again, the churches, the Lord of the church is speaking to all local churches, not only the seven that are mentioned here, to the one who conquers. There are all the churches, all Christians from all time, and then down to the one who conquers, each individual believer, the one who is obedient and goes on being obedient until his coming. I will give some of the hidden manna. What is that? Well, some think it's Christ, the bread of heaven who came down to sustain spiritual life, to, ig to ignite spiritual life, to initiate spiritual life, and also to sustain it. The hidden manna, hidden from the wicked and the disobedient, but not hidden from those who, by God's grace, humble, hear the word of God, humble their hearts and repent. For by grace you save through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The working of God's will and our will together. And then we read, and I will give him a white stone. This is a mystery. With a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. This is so personal. Is it worth enduring affliction for his name? Is it worth it not denying the faith in this world of denial? A white stone, what on earth is that? Some think it may be the, the, priest, the high priest in the Old Testament would have a garment, his outer garment, very beautiful, and on his chest would be 12 stones so, sewn in, each one representing one of the tribes of Israel. And the idea that, and I love this, that, that the stone is close to the heart of God. It speaks of acceptance. It also, I think of white, righteousness, purity, we have white robes, it's, it's pure, it's beautiful, stone permanent, purity and permanence. And then a name written on the stone, I've got a name written up in glory. Yes, it's between me and him, it's between you and him. Unbelievable, wonderful, awesome. Is it worth persevering? Is it worth taking a stand against the things the Lord Mentions here, Pergamum, I believe so. I've got a new name written up in glory. Have awe and fear of God, who is the very word of God. Keep his name and his faith. Don't compromise with the world, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Please, get in the word. Have hope. Have hope, as the Lord gives it here in this promise. And then finally, I would conclude by thinking of Philippians 1.21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. As I look through these churches, and particularly Pergamum, I thought about this, for to me to live is Christ, be faithful to his name and his faith, serving family and church family, making disciples until he comes. What a purpose. For to me to live is Christ, Paul says, as he's in a jail in Rome, under house arrest, I should say waiting trial possibly to be put to death. For to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's a man who has not fear any longer. He's not afraid of what people might say. He's living for Christ, and to die is gain. No more temptation, no more sin, and more of Christ. What hope we have, what promise. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Encourage your people. Lord, we have no strength in ourselves. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the one who disciplines us and calls us to be trained by that discipline, to have the peaceable fruit of righteousness growing and abiding in the very character of Christ growing in our lives. Thank you for each person in this church family. Draw us into unity in you. Help us to see our unity is in you and also to see the enemy and his wiles. And even as he's outside, he tries to creep inside and, and, and into our own hearts through worldly pursuits and passions. Help us, Father. Help us to love one another graciously, speaking truth to one another. This is not easy. It's not natural. But dear God, the Spirit of God at work in our hearts, we have a new nature now. And it, it's a new natural through Christ. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs>